Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations, where every week we dive into the topics of mental health, adversity, spirituality, or societal issues. I'm your host, Furkan Dandio. And join me in this week's episode where we dive into the intriguing world of the divine masculine and feminine energies with our special guest, Lindsay McCown. In a world where hashtags and trends dominate our social media feeds, the terms divine masculine and divine feminine have become more than just buzzwords. They've sparked a collective curiosity about our own inner balance. Lindsay, a seasoned expert in holistic well-being, guides us through the labyrinth of these energies, unraveling their significance beyond the digital realm. Together, we talk about the origins and meanings behind these concepts, questioning how they've seamlessly transitioned from ancient philosophies to trending hashtags. Lindsay is a intuitive femme under transforming paradigms in business, health, and communities through collaborative leadership, innovation, and practical, heart-centered approaches. She is dedicating to supporting people to reshape their perspectives, unlock their personal power, and embolden their purpose. She is a woman's spiritual empowerment coach, a lineage yoga and meditation teacher, a certified neuro encoding specialist, TEDx speaker, and a global live radio show host of Women Thriving Unapologetically on the world's leading live internet talk radio network, Voice America. Please check out Lindsay online. And if you could leave a review or a comments in the comment section, I would truly appreciate it. Lindsay, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm super grateful and I'm really excited about our conversation. But before we jump into it, I do want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the listeners and let us know a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do. That's such a big question. Who am I? We (laughs) ask this question in yoga all the time and we're always trying to dissolve all the labels. And so when someone asks you like who you are and what you do, then all the labels come right back on. Uh, (laughs) So, oh, but you know, what I do, let's start with that is, you know, what's really moving through me right now and what I'm feeling most guided to do in my life right now is to really support people in coming back home into this understanding of who they are um, outside of all the labels that society puts on them. And right. when we do that, what happens is that we become more empowered and more present and able to navigate through life's challenges with more ease. So that's essentially what I do. Now, the label for that, oh, there's so many things I could call myself. I could call myself a yoga and meditation educator or um, a spiritual empowerment coach. I'm also a speaker, but I always feel like these labels just really don't encapsulate what we actually do as um as people that are healers or in the service and or anything that we do in life. So mm. uh, I don't know if that was a exactly what you were asking or wanting me to reply and but no, no, this is great. And you know, one of the things I picked up on as you mentioned, because it, it resonates for me too, is in terms of where you're being guided and in this moment, what you you know, what you're feeling you, you need to do. Uh does that has that always been the case or it's constantly been a journey and it's changed over time? And, and the reason why I ask, because that's what it is for me as well. We have seasons in our lives that tend to direct us and, and guide us in different directions, I suppose. But yeah. You know, it's always been, I've always had this deep connection to, or yearning for a deep connection to spirit and the way that that has moved through me has changed over time. Now, did I always have in mind that this is what I would be doing um, for a living? No. I mean, my path was very different when I was younger. But as so many people on their journeys will tell you that there are certain things that happen in life that kind of redirect them. And I feel like it's just the universe's way of not denying you what you thought you wanted, but actually directing you to what's really most aligned with your heart and your soul. And so 
And I do feel like that evolves. Like what I'm doing right now is different than what I was doing two years ago. It's still within the same vein, but it has taken a new iteration and started to expand and grow in a way that I wouldn't have been able to really accept or own at that point in my life. Mm -hmm. So I think it's always evolving. And the, the key is to really be okay with allowing things to unfurl the way that they're meant to unfurl for you and to not right. grip too tightly to an expectation that you've placed on yourself or someone else has placed upon you. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and to your point, kind of not getting too attached to any of those things, right? And and letting it flow through you as you mentioned. And and that kind of feeds into the conversation I wanted to have with you is around these energies we experience, right? And you and I touched on offline around the aspect of the masculine and feminine that keeps coming up quite a bit. Um, it's talked about, I see it all over social media too, but I guess what, what I wanted to explore was uh, this understanding of what does that even mean? Because you see it everywhere and people tend to put labels around it as, as you, as you mentioned earlier. So how do we understand what this means and, and how can people step into their energies? And the other thing I want to perhaps touch on if we get there is this aspect of safety as well. There's a conversation around what does safety even mean when you're in those embodying those energies? Okay. So that's a lot of questions. So let <laughs> me, <laughs> you might help to help, help me, uh, yeah, yeah. With all of them. So, let me just start with, uh, you know, like, yes, the divine feminine, divine masculine language is starting to trend right now, um, which is a good thing. But we also have to understand um, that there's something much deeper than a trend. And we want to really sink into our own bodies for the answers. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes with these trends, we, we, they will create a little bit of a vibration within us or a resonance. And we're like, oh, that sounds really true to me. And then you start to look outside of yourself for the answers again. But when we really want to understand these energies, these really potent energies, we have to understand that they're within us. They're also all around us. But the best way to understand them is to start to understand our own bodies, our own energies, our own minds and allow the unfurling to happen for us with some guidance from, you know, teachers is always helpful, but the teachers are not always going to have all the answers for us. Mm -hmm. And so at, at this level of my understanding where I am in my life, this is my understanding of the divine feminine, and the divine masculine, and it can evolve and it's meant to evolve. So what I'm telling you now, I'm just saying that it could evolve in five years from now. And so we hold within us, and some of the information I'm sharing with you does come from ancient wisdom, especially from the yogic uh, philosophy and teachings that within us, we hold divine masculine and divine feminine energies, regardless of gender or gender identity. Mm -hmm. So, and one is not better than the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and if we look to the yin yang symbol in ancient Chinese philosophy, we can see that just from this symbol that the feminine and the masculine energies are equal and they're meant to be in harmony with each other. They're counterbalancing, they're interconnected. And so what we do as humans, we always want to put the label on something and we want to identify as good, bad, better than, less than. And so we have to understand that these energies are meant to be equal and in harmony within us. And one is not better than the other. But because our culture likes to label things, what's happened is we've labeled one as being better than the other right. through millennia of conditioning. And the one mm -hmm. that we've determined to be better than is the masculine energy. Um, and so what happens is when we identify with only one half of ourselves, because it's just one half of ourselves, if we put all of our energy into that one thing, that that aspect of ourselves can actually become inflamed and can turn right. toxic. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It's just like if we put too much energy in that, it becomes out of balance. And anything that becomes out of balance can become inflamed and toxic. And the other part that is just as important 
has now become more dormant and has now uh, we've lost touch with the power that that aspects, those aspects of ourselves have. Right. And so now it just, and it starts to play out in our physical bodies, our emotional or mental bodies, our connect, our ability to connect to spirit. And, and then it starts to manifest in physical form in a lot of different ways and it permeates through our culture. So um, guide me with the next question. Cause I feel like, yeah, I'm going, yeah. I feel like I'm no. going off on a tangent right now. Well, no, I think this is good. Um, I guess so. So there's this aspect of what's coming for me right now in terms of what you've shared is there. There's resistance to embodying those energies, right? So how can people become more aware of whether it's the divine masculine or feminine energy, and how can they get more comfortable with it? Because I think society almost teaches you ways to perhaps push back and resist. Whereas if you were to just accept it's, it's a lot easier, at least this is what I've observed and that's my experience, but I don't know if that's holds true for everyone, but I just wanted to get your thoughts around it. Yeah. So, you know, as soon as we're born, you know, the doctor, your parents look down and they see what, what sex you are. And immediately in that moment, there are labels put upon you, like what, who you're going to be, what you're going to be able to do um, with your life. And, and that's unfortunate because from that point forward, you're essentially being conditioned to fall in line with whatever gender you were born with. And, and that immediately starts to deny part of our potential. Mm -hmm. And so with that, you know, if you're born male, you're, you know, there's a tent, there's an idea that you're going to be able to go out there and, um, be more direct. You're going to be able to accomplish things. You're going to have a certain level of success. That's going to look different than a female. And then if you're a female, the, the predominant view is that, oh, you're going to be more quiet or gentle. You're going to be more nurturing and what happens is we start to see ourselves and our potential through this lens. It's like these glasses have been put on us from our, the moment that we are born. And then we start to see all life through that. And so it starts to limit us. And so what we want to do is start to remove those and start to feel into and understand that these energies are, it's kind of like if you want to think of potential energy. That we're untapped into. And if you, if, you know, our society always wants to be like thriving and, you know, achieving the best version of ourselves. But what, it, how can we achieve the best version of ourselves if we're denying half of our inner potential energy? So we have this potential energy that we've completely ignored that actually can provide us with greater understanding of who we are and a deeper, a deepening connection to higher levels of consciousness. Because I'll back up a little bit and say that it's the divine feminine that has this, the ability to tap in and tune in to uh, the higher levels of consciousness, to the, in, the intuitive realms, to uh, connections and the wisdom of nature, to uh, higher self. And so if we're not tapping into those parts of our abilities, like you just want to think of this, this is part of your ability to expand and to grow and to thrive. And so if you can tap into those potential energies, then what's going to happen is you're going to be able to step out, get outside of the box that you've all the, la the labels that have been placed on you and they're actually binding you in this, in this particular form. If you can break free of that and start to awaken these other energies, then you're going to be able to tap into greater levels of consciousness, which is going to help you find solutions to complex problems, it's going to enable you to really see yourself as a much more expanded version than society is limiting you. Now, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really, to your point, stepping into it and not resisting it, right? Um, that's kind of what I... Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's difficult to do because, you know, for millennia, we've said that the feminine is weak and subservient or the feminine is actually meant to you know if we're 
And sometimes the divine feminine gets mixed with being feminine. Right. And so, but we've always, we're, we've been taught to view that our feminine nature is not what's going to bring us success and happiness. It's like kind of um, an aside. Yeah. It's weak again. And, and it's unfortunate because regardless of gender or gender identity, we, we can feel this, whether you're a female, male, cis or trans. And it's like, well, you know, if I really embrace this aspect of myself, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, am I going to be ridiculed? Because, you know, what happens is when, you know, even if, if we're talking about um, the female gender, we've been for decades been trying to fit ourselves into the masculine model because that's the role that that's the ideal of success. And we have to fit in and integrate because if we don't fit in and integrate, then we are going to be ridiculed or, um, and so what we want to do is like, okay, that model is not working. It doesn't work for everyone. And it's actually, mm -hmm. um, it's out of balance. So we want to bring in this ability to be like, okay, can we understand that it's not the feminine nature isn't weak or less than it is just this untapped resource that can actually lead us into a new paradigm. And a lot of people don't want that new paradigm, you know, but the feminine nature itself is one that is deeply healing and deeply nurturing that is embraces more collaboration and instead of competition mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, this is, you know, goes against, you know, our culture, especially here in the United States and Western cultures, like it's all about capitalism and um, pushing ourselves to the extremes. Right power over you know got to be the best you got to be number one you got to burn the candle at both ends to the yeah. detriment you know step on anyone's neck to get to to the top right yeah which is the yeah. extreme masculine because the masculine is actually a beautiful energy that is really meant to be like um when it's balanced is in uh is really a protective energy protection out of love right. and it, this activating energy that can propel us forward in great acts of love and service and but when it's out of balance what happens is that tendency to want to protect becomes this tendency to want to control mm -hmm. out of fear instead of protect right. out of love yeah 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 i mean and and a couple of things that come up so i'll, I'll ask the first question there well, so obviously you touched on when, when the feminine's trying to step into the masculine, sometimes that's being pushed by society or culture, which can be an issue. So how do you find that? And I, and I think you touched on it, that balance rather than trying to feed into what you're being told, like, how can you embrace it? And then <clears throat> I guess the other piece is the in general, I guess for both the masculine and feminine, that healthy balance, because it seems like it is out of balance and, and there's that struggle there. So I don't know if that makes sense. The question I'm trying to formulate here, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is really accepting who you are and finding that right balance rather than trying to step into something that maybe you're not. And that could create, create a lot of issues. Uh huh. Well, can I back, can I, let me just back up that a little bit sure. because I feel like maybe a good place to start is like, how do we know if we are out of balance? Right. What does that even feel? What does that even feel like? What does that, how does that actually practically, what does that look like in our bodies and feel mm -hmm. like? And so one way to know that if we're out of balance, we kind of touched on some of that, that, that need to constantly push and strive and at the, at the, expense of our own bodies and maybe even right. other people or our environment but some physical symptoms that can show up is this tendency to feel over overworked exhausted like you're burning um like uh you're wired and tired at the same time if you're constantly um having creative blocks and you feel like you have to grit your way through things or 
uh, push and control your way through something. And uh, a physical symptom can be this constant knot in the gut. And so that's that's how we can tell that the feminine energy is a little out of balance or a lot out of balance, depending on how um, how frequently you're having these symptoms. And you know, chronic uh, illness can be a sign of like you're always getting sick. That can mm-hmm. be a sign that you're out of balance. And I'll touch on why that is in a minute. And then the mental symptoms of when the feminine energy is out of balance is when we are more negative. Like we are constantly seeing the worst in things before we see the best in things. We see what is wrong before we see what is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so we're constantly having negative or disempowering thoughts versus seeing or feeling into what is actually um, like the opportunities instead of the limitations. And then, you know, and I, I was one that was just, you know, I've been working for decades to unravel that because that's been a really deep um, impact from and in my life is this, I can tell that the disempowering thoughts are just prevalent and how and bringing in the feminine practices have helped me kind of start to unravel that. Yep. And some emotional cues are just the, the feelings of depression or jealousy. When we're out of, when the feminine is out of balance, it could be a lot of judgment and criticism and resentment and even anger. And then from a spiritual perspective, we just feel disconnected. We feel alone and lost. That we are uh, isolated. And that we are also, um, there's a sense of confusion about what our purpose is. There's a sense that we are, um, there's something missing in our life. And so what's missing is that connection to the feminine. Uh-huh. And so these, so if anyone's saying, oh, I feel a lot of these or I feel all of these, well, then that's a sign that it's an opportunity for you to come back and, and nurture those feminine aspects and the way that we can do that. And it's not, and this is not about self-care. This is about like really getting nurtured because the feminine is about nurturance. So what deeply nurtures us and what deeply nurtures us, especially according to like the spiritual traditions is that connection to nature. Yeah. And whatever nature means to you, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, go out and go hiking and camping. It could mean like you could just connect to your own personal garden or a house plant, but it's really about like, getting deeply nurtured and connecting to the natural rhythm of life. Because if we feel when the feminine is out of balance, we are not connected to the natural rhythm of life. And we don't feel like we're connected to the natural rhythm of life. And we feel isolated and alone. And then the fear starts to set in and then we start to compete more mm-hmm. and push ourselves harder, which is com- continuously feeds that cycle right so and you know there's different ways that we can nurture this feminine aspect um because the feminine aspect is deeply intuitive of course meditation is always a beautiful uh tool for that now does it mean it's the only way because some people are like i don't like to meditate you don't have to you could there's yoga nidra there's these um and bringing ourselves back into a state of rest is is key for connecting to the feminine and to also help heal some of the the masculine aspects that have gotten inflamed and out of balance because how many of us feel overwhelmed and over, and exhausted when and just completely depleted like we're always just running to keep up and we're never feeling like we are doing enough right and so rest is actually deeply tied to the feminine and this is this goes beyond sleep this is actually taking restful moments and finding stillness so that we can move out of that sympathetic rhythm that keeps us in the fight flight freeze or fawn states and helps soothe the nervous system so that we can get into that parasympathetic rhythm of rest which is an expanded state of consciousness and so when you're in that, that parasympathetic rhythm, what happens is that your consciousness actually opens up. Your brain is actually able to get out of its box. They call it um, when you're in that stress state, that chronic s- stress state, your brain actually cannot function outside of what it knows. Meaning that if you're in that chronic stress, you're only pulling information from what you know. It's impossible for you to actually reach outside of that and get new information to come in. 
Right. And so we have to get out of that state. We have to move into these these states of rest, into this more feminine nature so that we can actually, one, give our brains time to rest and actually, you know, come back to homeostasis and then be able to extend outward and pull in this new information. Okay, that was a really long answer for your question. <laughs> no problem. I appreciate that. And I guess because I, what I was, you know, for me, what was kind of coming up also in the background was the whole idea of, okay, well, what does it mean to be stepping into the masculine and, and what are some of the downsides of not? And I mean, there's also an aspect of be tapping into nature there. That's what I find. Uh, but more so from an expo exploration perspective, like being out there and exploring and, and learning. But I also think that if it's not well balanced, it shows up as some certain traits that we see where, you know, being over competitive. And I think for men too, there's an aspect of, uh, I've touched on this previously on this podcast too, is there's this tendency to, to over compete or be the leader, but you know, you can be the leader in your home. Uh, you don't always have to be a leader. You, sometimes you need to be supportive of other men. And, uh, so you're not competing, but how can you collaborate as you mentioned? Uh, from the perspective of the feminine, but there are certain things that you ha we have to be mindful of too, because uh, with men as well in that masculine space, which causes a lot of issues if not balanced appropriately. Yeah, I think about men, you know, the labels that are put on them and expectations, like it's such a heavy weight to carry, you know, like you have to be number one, you have to excel, you have to, um, you know, you know, if you're not winning, then you're a loser almost. It's well, just yeah. like, it's just this, and this, this pressure to be the leader, but we can redefine what leadership means too. Leadership doesn't mean that you're right all the time and that you have right. to take the, the lead. Sometimes being a leader is stepping back and, and nurturing other people and allowing them to, to grow and, and to their own fullness. I mean, leadership can look a lot of different ways. And I've been, exploring what feminine leadership looks like and feminine leadership is less about the the individual standing on stage and being the expert and like everybody right. look at me i'm i'm the central figurehead here and follow me it's right. more about how can we step into those more collaborative roles and uh, allow all of us to have a place and a voice and know that everyone's voice is um, integral and important to this web of life and to our communities and and be able to take um I had this uh guest on my uh my radio show Women Thriving Unapologetically recently, um, Kama uh Tay Mitchell, and she talks about in her nonprofit about how the idea of flocking. So this, you know, how geese fly in formation, this the formation, there's some there's someone always in the lead taking that lead, but when that leader gets tired, moves to the back and then right. someone else takes the lead. But everyone's is working together to get to their desti to the destination. They all are, have the same vision and they're working together. And it's not one person that's taken that role of leadership the whole way. Right. And so that's kind of an example of bringing in more of a feminine leadership approach. Um, and I don't, and it's kind of like, it's more of a balanced leadership approach. Yeah. Because it's definitely the masculine and the feminine working together um, in a, a more harmonious way of moving forward. And so, because I don't want it to sound like it's just just the feminine way of doing things. Right. Um, it's just bringing it a little bit more of the feminine so the masculine doesn't have to work so damn hard all the time. I mean, it's right. exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's, uh, and what I mentioned earlier when we started was this aspect of safety. And you can probably extend it to security. but in today's world, that's perceived as, oh, well, financial, how can I provide financially and provide that security or, or safety for that matter? But I think there's, it's deeper than that. And that's something I've kind of understood and, and exploring too. But you want to be able to, as a masculine, be able to provide that sense of security emotionally too, right? If you're not emotionally regulated, it doesn't matter, right? And then there's this notion of, oh, I want to be the protector. Well, how can you, it doesn't always have to be physical. It can be emotional too, right? Providing that sense of security and protection by being emotionally regulated, being in tune, 
uh, being able to attune to your partner as well, uh, but being present in that sense where you have the ability to understand those emotions uh, and, and regulate yourself. Um, so I don't know what your thoughts are around that because that's something I think gets often misconstrued because immediately in today's world, it's like, oh, am I bringing the money or am I bringing this physical aspect of protection? But it's like, it's deeper than that in my mind. Yeah. And it's, we've just take, taken one aspect of our divine masculine potential and focus on only that and not seeing it in its broader scope and uh, ability, which is, it's not just about providing financial security and physically protecting, but like you said, it's like, okay, how can I create a container right. for the feminine aspects within me as well within in my family to thrive? Because the interesting thing is in the yoga tradition, the divine masculine is potential energy where the divine feminine is like kinetic energy. Yes. So when um, the masculine energy is sta stable, like steady, then all the creative energy that is meant to move through you can move through you from a really rooted and grounded place. Right. So it's about being able to be really steady and, and, and our masculine energy so that the create the creativity of the divine feminine can flow through us. And we need that. I mean, when we are really grounded and well-rested, when we're really deeply connected to the earth and to spirit, what, hap what happens? Like amazing things can move through us. Like insights come in. We're able to uh, feel this kind of rhythm and flow and feel deeply nur nurtured. So it's like masculine creates the container for all of the stuff to come in and be held. And so it is like a protective force, but it's not just a physical protection. It's just creating the, a solid, steady, um, and I hesitate to say safe because, you know, nothing is ever 100% safe, but it's like a sanctuary. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes back to, the, you, I like the word you use container, right? Because it's, it is that container. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is beyond, and I'm not saying you don't have to be the provider or the protector, but it's beyond that, right? You can provide and protect, but you may not be a safe container, then it doesn't really matter, right? So I think a lot of people lose sight of that. And, um, and there's that focus just on being the provider and protector, as I mentioned. So yeah. how can you then, if you're in those, you know, you're in your divine masculine or your feminine, how can you then come together and hold that space for each other and have that container. Cause I think that's probably an, another important aspect that people don't typically understand, right? At least that's what I see. Um, so, so you've kind of embodied that in yourself. Now, how can you communicate that or create that space to, to perhaps even co-create? So are you meaning like, how can we do this for each other or yeah. Yeah. other people? Yeah. Well, it, all, it definitely always starts with, with yourself first. Yeah. Like, like, okay, how, how am I holding myself? Am I allowing myself space to rest? Right. Am, am I allowing myself time to connect to nature? Am I, you know, doing practices that develop my intuition? Am I um, allowing myself to feel things instead of stuffing these emotions down? And so when we start to do that, what happens is it naturally becomes easier to do for other people. Mm -hmm. We hear this all the time. Like, okay, you have to, you know, really tend to yourself first. And it's not out of self, it's not, you know, out of greed or selfishness or ignoring other people. It's like, okay, if I'm not really understanding my own, my own nature, then how can I create a container and hold other people? So it starts there and then it becomes just, it really does almost become second nature the more that you do that for yourself. I mean, it's not always easy because people are going to irritate the crap out of you. I mean, this, you're going to have your triggers because, <laughs> but what happens is you become aware. There's this ability to be oh, so deeply aware of, oh, there I am. I'm being pulled back out. I, this happens to me all the time. I, I sit behind my computer and all of a sudden I'm just like in that 
that mode again and I'm not pulling it away and I can start to feel the tension come in or I put too many things on my plate and I can start to feel myself moving towards that burnout again. I'm like, I have to pull myself back. Right. And I start to feel the fear come up because I don't, not enough money is coming in. And it's just this constant play of, can I keep trusting in the divine flow? And if I keep coming back to these states of rest, if I keep opening it up to the, the creative nature of the feminine, then what happens is that almost every single time, I will, well, I will say it's happened every single time when I do that, the actions that I do take, the divine masculine actions I take are so aligned Mm-hmm. It becomes so much easier. Right. It's when I don't take that time. And so what we're doing is we're taking that time for ourselves to become come back into that trustful, surrendered, receptive state so that we'll know exactly what our actions are meant to be so that when we take those actions, we're not having to expend as much energy as we would if we were just pushing ourselves through. And when we do that for ourselves, then we can start to allow space for other people to do that because our culture really judges people that take rest. Right. I mean, we really like put people on a pedestal that, you know, burn the candle at both ends. Right. You know, oh, I worked 16 hours a day. Like, really? That's amazing. And then all of a sudden we see all less than because we worked maybe five. Right. But, you know, from a productive standpoint, we're not actually being highly productive during those hours. And I mean, if you are working, I I think, what is it? 16 hours, maybe it's 19 hours. If you're up for 19 hours, you are essentially legally intoxicated. Like your cognitive ability, your your ability to, your motor functionings are that of someone who's intoxicated. And so we have to understand that we're really meant to have about 42% rest during, to really be our optimal selves, which is a lot. Yeah. So we have to allow or like check ourselves when we're judging other people. Like, are we, are we putting a badge of honor on people that are burning themselves out? Or are we celebrating those that are like, I need to take a rest today. I need to step away from this work for a little bit. I'm not, produ- I'm, what I'm producing right now is just coming from that exploitive state i'm just regurgitating stuff i'm just wasting my energy instead i'm just going to take a pause and step away yeah and i struggle with that like yesterday was a uh the day before yesterday was a terrible day like i woke up saying oh i have all this time to get all this stuff done i put all this pressure on myself and nothing was flowing and then i start to feel guilty because i'm not producing if i'm not producing then i'm not worthy and if i'm not producing, then I'm not making money. If I'm not making money, then what's going to happen if I don't make money? Then I'm not providing for my family. And then the, it all just starts to go. And then I have to pull back and be like, that's just conditioning. Yeah. So I just have to take a moment. Like, okay, I'm dedicating more time now. Like I've told my, like I've just started this not too long ago where I'm like, okay, every single day, my feet are going to be on the earth. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a beautiful time of year here. So I'm going to go ground. I'm going to be in nature. That's what works for me. It doesn't have to work for everyone. You can find another way. Right. And and be like, okay, I'm not going to start my day looking at my phone. I'm not going to start my day with my emails. I'm not even going to end my day with that. I'm going to end my day connecting back to my feminine nature so that I can let the masculine freaking rest. Mm-hmm. He needs some rest. <laughs> right. You right. need that deep rest. For sure. Yeah, and it's so important what you touched on there, just to kind of look at the idea of if you've kind of learned this ability to ground yourself, first of all, recognizing when you need that grounding, as you mentioned in your own example, because uh, I think we, to your point, we will get triggered. We will get escalated. So it's how are you able to ground yourself? But then also by modeling that for others, you're giving them that ability to do it for themselves and feel that aspect of regulation. Um, and then people feed off of that. So that's how you can show up for others and perhaps embody that in other people as well. So I think that's important being aware of it in terms of who you are, what you need and how to ground yourself. So then you're modeling that for others and, and creating that, uh, environment of yeah. safety. And, and then I think 
lot of people do gravitate towards that because that is our natural tendency. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I think you t touched on it a lot earlier in this episode, the whole notion of homeostasis, right? If that's where we're supposed to be in that balance state and, and we lose sight of it, especially with the hustle culture we're in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else you feel like the listeners could benefit from and we haven't perhaps touched on that would be of value to add here? Oh, one <laughs> thing. <laughs> oh, there's so many things, but, you know, compassion is really, really essential. Like if self-compassion is at the heart of divine feminine awakening. And it's not an easy thing to do right. um, for men or for women. And, but when we can give ourselves that compassion, what happens is we immediately start to unravel some of these, the dominant cultures, belief systems that have been really weighing us down and holding us back. Because when we are like, oh, I recognize that I need to pull back. I need some rest. I recognize that I, so, and, and allow yourself to have that, to recognize when there's a part of you that's been being activated or judgmental, offering compassion to that part instead of judgment. Okay. When, or, and then extending that out to someone else, like, oh, they're, this person is probably reacting that I don't know what their story is. I don't need to know their story, but I can offer them compassion. And in doing that, I'm releasing my judgments that I'm placing upon them. I'm not going to judge them for needing to take rest or not being able to show up the way that they, I expected them to show up because I don't know what's going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. But understanding that if they're not showing up the way that I want them to, one, check why I have an expectation on that. But two, understanding that there's something going on in their lives enough that they just need to have some space and allowing them to have that space. So compassion, compassion, compassion is really at the heart of really healing a lot of the wounding that we've placed upon ourselves and upon other people. Right. And it can really start to unravel a lot of the, yeah, just the, the toxic beliefs that we have. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think with that compassion, you're able to, you're able to hold away from judging others too, right? Because then you've, you've given it to yourself but then you're also giving it to others and, and then there's no place of judgment. And I think that's kind of what holds us back in society is, is this inability to have compassion for ourselves. And then it's easier to judge everything. Yeah. Um, it creates a lot of issues, right? We're not all the same. We're all trying to figure it out. Um, and that's part of the journey, right? So how can you not only give yourself that grace, but hold that space for others. And I have a, a colleague and, and even a men, I'd even call her a mentor because she's amazing. She was on my, my show as well. Her name is Jean Maze, And she always says that everyone is doing the best that they can in this moment. And it's hard to accept at times, but you know, if you could have done better five seconds ago, you would have. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so we have to understand that that compassion for ourselves, but other people, like if they could have done better, they would have based right. on what they have learned in their lives, what their belief system, the, the lens that they're looking through, what they believe to be true. And so we're just constantly learning. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hindsight is 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lindsay, for coming on here and sharing your wisdom and having this conversation with me for listeners that do want to find you or get a hold of you. What are some ways they can do that? So obviously I have a website, it's just my name, lindsaymccowan.com. They can reach me there and I offer a complimentary one-on-one -on -one session for those that just want to kind of explore what working together would look like. So, cause you know, I always feel like we should try something on to see if it fits first. And, and that this just gives an opportunity because to see, 
you know, what's going on in your life, what you might need support with and see if I'm the right person for that and see if it will work really well together. So you can go to my website for that. And also if you sign up for my newsletter, I send you three amazing practices that help you feel rested and supported. <laughs> so one of which is a breathing practice, one's a meditation and one's a yoga nidra. So it really helps you connect deeply to the rest state and the feminine. And of course I'm on social media, but I really love to build community. So if anyone wants to just email me, I, I respond very quickly to that. Probably more so than social media. So I'm a little bit of a, an anomaly there. And, uh, and also I have a radio show, Women Thriving Unapologetically. So if anyone wants to tune in and listen, it's a great platform that's on the rise to support uh, us to understand what real thriving means right. and how to move through our challenges in life with more grace and ease. Perfect. Yeah, no, I'll put all of that in the show notes as well. So yeah. thank you again for coming on here. And, thank and you. Helping. Yeah. It's been great to be here and appreciate you inviting me on to uh, Easy Conversations. It's been an easy conversation. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you for checking out this episode with Lindsay. As always, please leave a review or a comments in the comments section. I always love hearing from you. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. That's the best and easiest way to support the podcast. And also check out our sponsors. Thank you again. And until next week.